Good evening and welcome to this special Q&A focused on good teaching. I'm Tony Jones, here to answer your questions. Teacher turned champion of the Finnish education system, Parsi Salberg. Centre for Independent Studies Education Research Fellow, Jennifer Buckingham. Primary school teacher, Gabby Stroud, who quit the profession she loved in frustration. Award-winning classroom and YouTube maths teacher, Eddie Wu. And Indigenous teacher and advocate, Cindy Berwick. Please welcome our panel. Thank you very much. Now, Q&A is live in Eastern Australia on ABC TV, iView and News Radio. Well, tonight, with Year 12 final exams in sight, we've gathered a stellar panel and an audience full of eager students, parents and teachers to talk about better schools. And our first question comes from Miriam Lees. Hey, good, good evening. Um, it's not OK to say I can't read, but it's OK to say I can't do maths. Why do you think that's the case? Eddie, you start with you, obviously. As a mathematics teacher, having heard this statement many, many times, I feel as though there's a sense of frustration boiling in my mind because I struggled with mathematics when I was at school. And so, so to be able to say... you were a maths genius when you were at school? No, and I'm still no maths genius <laughs> now. Uh, but for me, that always felt a little bit like an excuse. And then I realised, I think, Miriam, that in many ways there was a, uh, a sense of wanting to have a reason, wanting to have a almost... Not an excuse, but a reason to say, look, this is something that I've struggled with. Mathematics is hard. Mathematics is abstract. It is, you know, for the last 300 years, all the mathematics that we've invented as human beings have been things that regular people on the street have found mind-blowing. And so we want a reason to be able to say, yeah, that was too hard for me. And I think the reason that we grab for is it's just not my thing. It was genetics. It was society. And so I think it's almost as though we're looking for something to comfort us, to say, this is difficult. There was a reason why and it didn't have to do with me. Now, Eddie, it wasn't my thing either, as it turns out, even though my dad was a maths teacher. But I do remember from school, the square on the hypotenuse equals the sum of the squares on the other two sides. And I didn't really understand it until I saw your WooTube version of this. Now, how is it that you can explain things that many other people struggle with? Well, in fact, I think struggle actually is the key uh, because at school, the humanities, English, history and drama were the subjects that I enjoyed most, Tony, uh, despite the fact that your dad wrote some of the textbooks, Jones and Couchman, if anyone appreciates that, that classic. Modern mathematics. It was a classy, classy work. But that struggle that I experienced as a student I still carry with me now after more than 10 years of teaching. And so I can actually look at a student and at the look in their eyes and I can say, I know what that feels like. And I think that empathy is the key ingredient of great teaching. You would have seen that look in my eyes many times <laughs> if I'd been in your maths classes. Not to worry about that. Cindy Berwick, now you were a maths teacher for 20 years. I was. So why do you think it is that people say it, it's OK to say I can't do maths? Why do you think that? Well, I guess unlike Eddie, I was actually, I actually enjoyed maths and and uh, it was probably because I didn't like literacy and I hated reading. So, you know, I think in those days you, there was no such thing as literacy and mathematics. So I think I gravitated towards maths because there was nothing to do with reading about it. So I actually really enjoyed maths and I actually enjoyed imparting my knowledge to, um, to young students and opening their mind. And I guess for me, it, it's about how you teach it, you know, and that... Well, you've got a special way of doing that, haven't you? Particularly with young Indigenous kids. You yeah. take them out on STEM camps. Can you tell us what that... What yeah, that we actually look at, you know, mathematics and, and science and technology through our, our cultural lens. And so we actually teach uh, aerodynamics through the boomerang and because uh, the boomerang actually led to the invention of propellers, which then led to flight, which then led to, you know, the invention of drones, which now patrol our coastlines and uh, save us from sharks and, and used in fire and rescue. So there's a lot of things that we do um, in our camps that relate to... We teach chemistry through the toxins in plants that, that our ancestors used to, to eat. We teach uh, throwing a boomerang. The, there's a... If you want to returning boomerang, if you want a boomerang that's returning, you need to throw it at a certain angle. So you, there's, a, there's actually a lot of mathematics in, in everything that we do and it's very, and we try and relate it to culture, which then, you know, it sparks the interest of Aboriginal kids. Now, Parsi, I only realised this evening that you started as a mathematics teacher as well. And of course, part of the Finnish model is to, is to have fun uh, as part of your education. Um, were you able to do that with mathematics? We've just heard how these guys do it. How, how about Finland and how about your own methods? No, myself, I, I didn't, I didn't 
uh, know how to make ma mathematics fun. But you know, one, one thing I, I realized, that this goes back to the, the, the question earlier, is that young people, and probably many parents as well, have a very peculiar images of what mathematicians do when they are in work. Mm -hmm. And so when, when I was a young math teacher, I, I carried out this uh, research that ended up being a larger research uh, later on, simply asking my students, pupils in a, in a middle school, that what do you see, what do you imagine when you think about a mathematician at work? And guess what they saw? They always saw a male, unstylish, fat, unmarried, <laughs> and somebody who has no other friends but other mathematicians. <laughs> So, so I, I think that, you know, the one, one reason why it's so easy to say that, you know, reading is good and many other things are important, but math is not, because most people don't really understand what mathematicians do, what they are like. You know, for, for most of us, the, the only things that math uh, people do is that they teach math, uh, mathematics at the university to those who are going to teach mathematics at school, and that's it. <laughs> so we have to change that. We have to help young people and parents as well to understand that mathematics is much more than just what you see in a school. Yeah, well, Eddie, uh, you should respond to that because you're I, not, you're not in type yeah. at all and you have no, to I, make mathematics cool. Well, I think Pazzi strikes on something in that there's a, a real lack of understanding about what mathematics is in that, you know, there's a sense that it's about numbers. It's about numbers and equations and solving problems and getting to an answer, the elusive thing at the back of the book. And of course, numbers are a huge part of mathematics, but that's because mathematics is a study of patterns and relationships and connections. There are lots of those in numbers, but there are lots of those in lots of other spaces, which is why a lot of those people who feel like, I don't do maths, but I will talk about the statistics of my favourite team uh, till the cows come home, I will be able to calculate change, I will be able to know exactly when's the right time to take my foot off the brake so I can hit the green. All of that is pattern sensing, which is mathematical. Um, well, we have just a bit of information here about our audience because we asked tonight's uh, studio audience to tell us their favourite subject. 24% said English, 15% history, maths, I'm afraid, was a distant third with 13. Sad to hear that, Eddie, I dare say. I'm unsurprised, but that's what I'm working on. Yeah, that's right, it is too. Let's go to another question on mathematics from Fiona Foley. Um, hi, Tony. Uh, what are your thoughts for the panel on making mathematics mandatory in years 11 and 12, considering the current focus on STEM technology for future education demands and employment? Start with Jennifer. What do you think? It's very difficult to make something compulsory in year 11 and 12 if uh, children are struggling with it in the earlier years of school. Uh, and I think that's where we need to start is making sure that maths is being taught really well so we don't get to that point where, that Miriam talked about where children lose confidence uh, and where they start to believe they're just not good at, at maths. And one of the difficulties with maths is it's so sequential and if you miss some steps along the way, it's very difficult to recover and it's very easy to lose confidence. So I think that's probably the first priority is making sure that um, all children are up to the standard of being able to study in maths in year 11 and 12. Gabby, what do you think? Yes, I'd agree with that. <laughs> uh, look, I think that, you know, when we start talking about making things mandatory and, you know, what's got to happen um, as students approach the end of school, we need to be thinking about the future that we're preparing them for and the jobs that they're going to go into. But I really think, too, um, when we're at the end of school, we don't necessarily know what we're going to do with the rest of our lives. You know, when 17 and 18, we're still figuring a whole bunch of stuff out. So, you know, I think this idea of making it mandatory, if it's not your passion and if it's something that, you know, like you were just saying, if you've missed the sequence, if you've struggled with it, you know, if we're just going to be flogging dead horses there, then maybe that's not maybe that's not the right thing to do. I, I just think that year 11 and 12, you know, they're formative years, but they're not the decisive years. They're not determining everything that's going to happen for the rest of your life. So, you know, just because we graduate school doesn't mean that we're finished learning. You know, if you later on, like Eddie, discover this passion for maths, you can go ahead and you can explore that then. Can I see, uh, well, sure. No, Jennifer, go ahead. I just wanted to add one thing. Um, I think that there's an exception if um, people want to study uh, a degree in university that requires a high level of maths, so engineering, for example, so prerequisites for studying certain courses in university makes sense that there'd be at least a high level of maths at the end of school. 
Yeah, but that means they have to figure it out while they're at school what they want to do later. Right, so, right. Uh, Parsi, how do you handle this in Finland? Because you've got a very strong reputation for STEM subjects. And I'm wondering, is it mandatory to keep studying uh, maths and possibly science all the way through school? I, I think, uh, Tony, the key, key question here is that what, what are we thinking about when we ask this question of mathematics in, in a high school? I think every school, it should be mandatory that every school will offer students math courses that are something different that they have done before. For example, focusing on things that they can use in their real life, like, like economics or statistics or something like this. I think too often we think about kind of a traditional way of uh, teaching mathematics as it's always been in a school. I, I think mathematics is very important for everybody, but not necessarily the mathematics that we are now teaching and, and making compulsory for everybody. Cindy, what do you think? Um, Indigenous kids would obviously benefit by being able to go on and do STEM courses. Should it be compulsory? Well, I think, it, personally, I think it should be compulsory for all students because I think the world revolves around mathematics. There's actually, I think we, you know, there's, there's careers, but there's mathematics in everyday life. You know, like Eddie said about breaking of cars, fixing cars, going to the shops, buying things, financial numeracy. There's a whole lot of things that you use in everyday life. I actually taught a kid once who, who, who struggled with volumes and surface areas and he came back a year after and said, I now know why you taught me that. He said, I'm a gas fitter. And if I don't get the volume right, I'm going to blow up everybody's house. <laughs> and, I said, and I thought to myself, God, I'm glad I taught you something. <laughs> don't blow up you anybody's house. You save lives, house. That's, That's right, amazing. I save lives. <laughs> Teacher that saves lives. But, um, but, you know, I think kids have got to see the relevance you know, of it and, and what they can use. And I don't think, you know, there's, there's relevance in everyday life. And I think... One of the things we were actually in trying to at, at one of the school, at one of my schools, we tried to get kids interested in mathematics, and we looked at the all the university options, and there's not that many of universities first year courses that don't have a maths element to it. Mm. The architecture, you know, or the visual arts, like they all have a mathematics part to it. Medicine, so, obviously. Medicine, you know, yeah. everything, and I think you know it's about how you teach it, the relevance of of how they're doing it, and they need to be exposed to, to, you know other forms of mathematics that they may consider as careers furthers down the track, but if, if the basic is about living life with a certain skill set. Yeah, Eddie, what do you think? Because, I mean, you went on and became a real maths whiz when you were 19, so you'd left school, but you must have, to keep that sequential knowledge up, you must mm. have studied all the way through school. So should it be mandatory? Because you wouldn't have had that option otherwise. Mm. Well, I, I want, especially as a mathematics teacher, I want as many children as possible to study mathematics. I'd love them all to. But two things. I mean, I would want them to choose mathematics because they see its value. They see its, its import to daily life and they, they want to learn it. They have an appreciation, so they choose it. And secondly, I think it's really important to mention, um, and I guess I'm the person in the classroom seeing it, we don't have enough mathematics teachers as it is. That's the reason why 15 years ago I went down this path instead of becoming an English history teacher. If we added another 6,000 year 11 and 12 students, we'd be in some serious dire straits. Uh, and so there's a lot of groundwork that needs to be laid before anything like that can be considered. 10 to 15 years planning minimum. OK, let's move on because we've got a lot of questions tonight. Our next one comes from Alyssa Melly. Hi. As a current Year 12 student, I've come to expect seeing my peers bawling in the common room. Many of my classmates appeared disgruntled, stressed, depressed, and the standard response to how are you is tired. And at one of my friends' schools, there's a really alarming number of girls on antidepressants <coughs> already at 17 or 18. And beyond all the stress, there's an overwhelming sense of boredom as we write the same essays on the same texts again and again and again for about a whole year. Um, you feel like you're on Groundhog Day and you feel trapped and like you're actually being hindered from learning opposed to being helped. And you can very easily become very apathetic, very resentful, very frustrated. Is there a better way than this? Gabby, I'll start with you and uh, with, with the HSC coming up um, and other exams throughout the country, there must be a lot of uh, young people feeling like exactly like this at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. There's tonnes of them and they're not just in Year 12. I think we're seeing a time where education in Australia, we, jeepers, we must be getting close to rock bottom because I think there are teachers that are suffering, there are students that are suffering, and what you're saying, Alyssa, is just exactly that. You, and I just want to say I am so sorry. <coughs> I'm sorry that you and your peers feel like that because that's not what it's meant to be like. That's not what it's meant to feel like. 
And I think that what you're describing, this, I loved that description, and your question just gives me hope. You know, you kids are uh, succeeding in spite of the system, not because of it. And your question just gives me hope. And I love that expression, you know, this same essay that I'm churning out all year long. I think actually what you're speaking about is the effects of standardisation that we're feeling completely across the board from kindergarten, because I've taught kindergarten kids that, well, I mean, they didn't feel it in my class, but, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, you know, we, we see these effects, you know, right through till um, year 11 and when year When you're talking 12. about standardised testing, aren't you? I'm talking about standardised testing, I'm talking about a standardised curriculum and I'm talking about professional teaching standards. Mm. And it's this blanket, one size fits all, let's just churn it out and, um, you know, sprinkle out the education on all these kids and presumably, you know, they'll all come out the other end and, you know, things will all be fine and we'll collect a whole bunch of data on it and the graphs will go up. And, you know, I'm here to tell you they're not, they're not. The graphs are going down, the students are disengaged, the teachers are struggling and something needs to change. Let's hear from Jennifer because I think you actually, you believe that uh, testing is vital. Um, is, it, is there a better way, is what our uh, questioner is asking, than the constant pursuit of a higher ATAR uh, in the HSC and the standardised testing that leads up to that over many years? Well, there's, there's testing and there's testing. That, the HSC is a very stressful experience and uh, because it is high stakes, uh, there, there is a lot that hinges on, and or that students at least feel hinges on them getting an ATAR that enables them to do what they want to do, which is interesting in a way because there are more alternative routes into university now than there ever was. You know, it, when I did the HSE, it was um, TER or BUST. You know, there were, weren't any other ways that, you, you know, really you could get into a university course. Uh, so that world has opened up a little bit. Um, it, it, with respect to NAPLAN, though, I think that that's quite a different question. NAPLAN doesn't have the sort of stakes attached to it um, for the student particularly. You know what, we'll come HSC on to does. NAPLAN in more detail in a little while. Stick just for a moment to, is there a better way than the HSC um, with all this stress laid on um, many uh, uh, students across the country, uh, not only the HSC, of course, but the other versions of that in different states. Yeah, they may well be, and, st and different states do different things. And um, and look, if students are feeling as though they're writing the same essay multiple times all throughout the year, then then that. Uh, shouldn't be the case. That shouldn't be the way that you achieve a high score or that you show what you've learned. So there must be a better way if, that, if that's the way that you're being taught. Parsi, what do you think? Um, you, I mean, you've, here, you've here, been here long enough to kind of work out um, how we do it um, in New South Wales and other states. Uh, what do you think about that? And what do you think about the stresses uh, that these HSC students in New South Wales are facing now and in other states in their different exams? Yeah, I think this is, a, first of all, this is a very important question. And, um, uh, you know, if I, if I compare that to what is happening to people like you in many other countries, certainly in my old, old country, Finland, um, is, is that Australia has the highest compulsory instruction hours required from your children throughout their compulsory education than any other country in the world, uh, let alone Finland. So it means that you already have a kind of a packed uh, uh, school years full of uh, instruction and school days are much longer than elsewhere. That's why you have much less time for play and many other things and recess and, and those things that make your school day lighter and, and more comfortable. And that's a big difference if you compare um, Australia to almost any other country in the world, certainly, certainly Finland, that the, the students all the way up to the 12th grade have much more time during the school day to do other things than study and st sit in a classroom. And the other thing, of course, is you were asking about if, is there another way, is that you, can, you, could, you could have much lighter way of uh, employing those standardised tests and, and, and control systems on your schools that you have right now. That's what I've learned my, during my time here. Eddie, what do you think? I really sympathise with this as well. I mean, year 12 was a tough time for me. There was a lot of, a lot of family stuff going on. I, my mum was really sick. And just you add on to that, this incredible amount of stress. And I, I think there is a better way. Um, I think about, for example, when we... If you ask someone, oh, you know, you play, you play the violin, that's amazing. You know, you're an eighth grade violinist. How old is an eighth grade violinist? And the answer is they're, they're 12, 
or 33 or, or 70? And the answer is where, whenever they are ready for that, they will go ahead and learn it. And I, I learned mathematics in a way that sort of, we have this conveyor belt, unfortunately. It's not just mathematics, in fact, it's uh, all of the curricula around Australia. We say, okay, it's time to move on from this. You know, I, I'm afraid to ask this, but Elizabeth, do you study mathematics? I don't do any math or <laughs> That's okay. arts and humanities. No, it's totally fine. Uh, once upon a time in year 9 and 10 you had to do maths. You probably learned about these things, you know, trigonometry, sine, cos and tan. Somewhere in your deep repressed memory, all of you have that there. <laughs> and the thing was, you know, that's, that's getting at something very simple about how positions relate to each other. But you, most people probably learned, oh, sine of this angle gives this number. And then before you could pause and understand what that really represented, you got tested on it and then it was time to move on. And unfortunately, I think it's that, that very industrialised model toward learning which does treat everyone much like, you know, oh, you're 15 years old, it's time for you to learn calculus. Um, I think that that's a real misrepresentation of what students are. They're human beings, not machines in a factory. And I think that it's true. We have to be able to uh, break a few things to be able to get to that system because we're not going to get there through evolution. It's going to take something more dramatic than that. Cindy, just give us a, a kind of uh, a picture of what it's like in your school uh, when uh, you see uh, your students facing these kind of stresses with the HSC coming up? Oh, look, my heart breaks. I mean, you know, the first thing I'd probably say is I'm glad I'm not a student now because things are a little bit different back in my day. And I think, you know, we need to actually, you know, go back to trusting the profession and trusting in the professionalism of teachers. And how they and how they teach kids and and where how where they teach it rather than standardised testing. Okay, let's move on because we've got another question. I said we'd go to Naplan. We've got a question on that from Megan O'Grady. Hi. Hey there. Uh, both primary schools and high schools are becoming more like marketplaces and less like education institutions. With Naplan and HSC results as the most valuable assets, as opposed to student learning and well-being. Could this be the reason for the poor results that we're seeing in schools? Um, and could better results be achieved through a focus of student engagement and personal achievement? Jennifer, I'll start with you. Uh, linking NAPLAN with, you know, as a cause of poor results doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. It's sort of like um, blaming the X-ray for the fracture. The NAPLAN puts a bit of a spotlight on what uh, what the level of performance is, and it's only a gauge, and as you know, it's only one day um, of reading, and it's only every two years, and it's a snapshot at that point in time of where um, a school is going, progressing, you know, where, where the students in a school um, are progressing with their learning, and it's just providing information that wasn't there before. So before NAPLAN, we didn't have any kind of data um, about progress of students um, in the key areas of the curriculum, so in literacy and numeracy. So we had to, if you're a parent, um, deciding whether or not um, a particular school is the right school for your child, you were relying on reputation, word of mouth, whether or not the school uniforms were nice, whether the school grounds were nice, um, what you'd heard from other parents. There wasn't that extra element of information. And I think in terms of the idea that NAPLAN is sort of creating a marketplace, I've not really seen any evidence of that. The studies that um, I have seen have shown that parents have NAPLAN as one of the things that they look at, um, but they, they look at other things and rate other things more highly. So I think NAPLAN, I think it's useful, but I think it has to be kept in perspective. Gabby. Well, I have very serious concerns about NAPLAN and they uh, again speak to that idea that I've raised about the standardisation of education and I'm really actually quite tired of hearing about how NAPLAN's just a snapshot and it's just a couple of days and it's just this and it's just that. Putting the word just before these things doesn't absolve NAPLAN of the impact that it's having on our students. So Alyssa's question earlier or her comments, you know, Alyssa's of the generation now, she would have been doing NAPLAN right from <coughs> year three all the way through. And what we're seeing now are our students are disengaged, they're disheartened, you know, they're not... Um, they're not excited to come to school. They're not enthused about their learning. And this is the effect that NAPLAN's having. Yeah, I mean, what, what about the standard. effect on uh, teachers? Um, it's teaching special. Um, well, how, did, I mean, how did it affect your teaching, for example? Look, it's offensive to me to hear that, you know, um, before NAPLAN we didn't have any data. We did. We have teachers. You go in and you knock on the... <laughs> 
You know, as a teacher, I do incredibly important work. I engage with these students and I follow them step by step through this learning. And I can tell you at the end of the day, albeit that I will be exhausted, but I can tell you what that child can read now and what new gains they made with their writing and where they're up to with their maths. I am human as instrument assessor. And that's important, that is valuable. And all of this, you know, we'll throw out the NAPLAN test and then we'll, you know, we'll get this result. You know, saying that it's like blaming the X-ray for the bone being broken, the bone's not broken. We have teachers there and they have important skills, they have important understandings about assessment. And we need to value them because we are losing that. And it's a great, great tragedy. Br brief answer on this one, but I, you can hear your frustration. Mm -hmm. I, mean, is this, I can hear is it too. It... I'm ranting and I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Um, you're telling us what you think. And actually, it's important because this seems to be why you left teaching a yeah. profession you loved. Yeah. Yeah, I did, because in the end, I felt that I wasn't being valued. And if I could just... Um, oh, you told me to be brief. I'll say it really quick. <laughs> At the end of my teaching career, I thought I was burnt out. I thought that's what had happened to me. Um, but I've since done a whole bunch of reading and a whole bunch of research on this, and I realised that I wasn't burnt out. I was suffering the effects of demoralisation. And... What demoralisation is, it's, it's different to burnout, but it has similar symptoms. Because burnout suggests that I didn't manage my resources well enough, that I didn't take care of myself well enough, that I didn't get my assessments done on time, that I should have done a bit more yoga and maybe eaten some more vegetables, yeah. right? Demoralisation is something very, very different. Demoralisation is this idea where you, as a professional, know very, very clearly what is best for your students and the direction <coughs> you should take them in, and you are told again and again to go in another direction. And that is demoralising. I'm sorry, I'm going to get upset now, but that is demoralising for me as a professional, for someone who brings herself to the classroom and to the work and to those children every day. So I think we need to start having a very serious think about and conversation about NAPLAN and the impact that it's having and more broadly that idea of standardisation. Parsi, uh, uh, Jennifer, I know you want to come in. I just want to hear from uh, Parsi first. And I, I guess I want to hear if you don't have this kind of standardised testing in Finland, um, what, what do you think, how do you think your teachers would respond to it if it were introduced in the same way as what we're hearing? Or would they accept that you need to have a gauge of how well schools and teachers are going and how well students are measuring up against some standards? No, I, I think that the teacher's response certainly would be a strike or something, <laughs> something similar. But, and, and the response exactly as you said, Gabby, that the, the teachers in Finland would say that, that we know, we have the way to report to the parents how, how your children are doing. I, I, by the way, I think it's a, it's a very fair question. Uh, me as a parent or any, anybody else here, we want to know how our children are doing. But my view is, and, and I, I share this with many, uh, m most of the teachers in Finland, is that we don't need a standardised testing system like NAPLAN for that. We have to keep in mind that standardised tests like NAPLAN is created for one purpose and one purpose only, and we should not use it for any other purposes, for example, ranking or creating schools. Yeah. And if the question here is that I often hear when I travel around this beautiful country, <laughs> my new home, uh, 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 pe people are saying that... We should, we should, we should pause here. Just to, th This is your first day this as an Australian <laughs> resident, so you're one of us now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm one of you. Yeah, so so this, this, is my, this is my issue as well. So I, you, you know, if the question is, and again, this is a very fair question, if you're, if you're a taxpayer, as I will be in this country as well, uh, many, many of you. I think it's a fair question to ask that how are the, the school system, how the kids are learning? But the response is not necessarily uh, a kind of a NAPLAN type of standardised test that is testing all the children all the time. It's just like your, if you go to do your medical check, and most of you do it um, every year. 
when you go to see the clinic and, and your doctor, she or he doesn't suck all the blood out of your body, right? <laughs> it just takes the, take a sample to tell you whether you are in a good health or not. And we can do exactly the same thing if the question is that how healthy is our education system. And the, the standardized testing data like NAPLAN should not be used for any other purposes. For example, uh, uh, helping parents to select or choose the school okay. for their children. That's, right. that's not uh, the uh, way it's um, I want to hear from the other side, but Jennifer wants to respond to this and go ahead. Yeah, uh, just a couple of things. From the, the perspective of a, a researcher, um, NAPLAN data is incredibly useful because we know more now about whether or not policies have been effective. Um, we can see trends um, that we couldn't see before. So that, that's sort of at the macro level. Um, also from, you know, from the parent perspective, I hear from a lot of parents um, who say that they didn't have any indication that their child might be struggling with other literacy or numeracy until they got their NAPLAN results. Um, they'd been told that, you know, that their child was, was doing fine, that they'd catch up, that everything was okay, um, but NAPLAN provided, and the, and the information in that, which was, you know, it is standardised. Standardised isn't a dirty word. It just means that it's pegged against a benchmark that allows you to make some sort of um, assessment of um, whether or not that child is, uh, or where, they, where they sit on the range of achievement. Uh, Jennifer, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass over to this side because I want to hear uh, from Cindy. And uh, NAPLAN um, has a, an interesting history in New South Wales. Um, and a lot of Indigenous kids, in fact, the statistics were startling, uh, in the past year had to go back and resit their NAPLAN tests, 87% of them, I think, uh, in this state, had to resit NAPLAN tests in order to go on and do the HSC. Um, now, tell us the impact of that. Well, actually, I'm not a fan of NAPLAN, to be honest. Um, but, but one of the... It is just a moment and a snapshot of a moment in time. And I think... Um, it's, it's written through the dominant, it's written through the cultural lens of the dominant society, which I think disadvantages Aboriginal kids. And there's, there's a whole, it's not just as simple as, you know, our history of accessing schooling hasn't been great over the last, you know, 30 years. And um, that will take a while for the policies and practices to actually go. I mean, you know, it's been in my time that we were excluded from school. So it's, it's not that far. Do you think the testing is actually unfair to Indigenous kids? Oh, I do. Because of the cultural Well, from the cultural the lens of, of which they are, right. and I think it disadvantages them. And I don't think there's enough uh, support put in place to actually support Aboriginal kids in achieving literacy and numeracy benchmarks. Eddie, NAPLAN. <laughs> All I want to add You is want benchmarks that... for mathematics? <laughs> you want to know how well your students are doing? OK, so when I come back to this original question and think about I, th I think there is an easy narrative to buy into, which is that uh, it's, it's really doom and gloom. And I think as the, as the one incumbent teacher on the panel, I think I, I have a real responsibility to say there is great work happening in schools that are not treating it as, yeah, it's, this is, you know, at my school, we buy a thousand pencils that's our NAPLAN preparation, you know? <laughs> and we've, we've got it, we're ready, we use it as a, as a data point. But I think what's really dangerous here, like I, as a mathematician, I love data. Statistics is really, really useful. But data has a dark side. Um, dark, data is not amoral. I think we'd like to believe that it is. We've accepted that, that kind of word, but it's, it's, it's not. Um, Dylan William, the educational researcher, talks a lot about the value of feedback and how important it is to give verbal feedback and not just numerical feedback. But to me, one of the most amazing things is when you give students numerical feedback and verbal feedback, they behave almost just like the people who got no verbal feedback at all because numbers have power. You look at, I, it's heartbreaking whenever, and it's not just NAPLAN, um, you know, I'll have my year 12 students and they've just gone through a set of exams and the first question they ask is, what was the test out of so I can work out what 50% was? <laughs> and then they can work out whether they're above or below this arbitrary line because that number speaks to them in a way they can't quite express, but it's super dangerous. I think we just have to recognise that these tools often have a very good intent behind them, but they often have more power than we intend. Let's move on because, we've, as I said, we've got a lot of questions. This one's from Vivian Zhu. Uh, this one is to Mr Salberg. Given that Finland has a largely homogenous population in terms of race and religion and has less income inequality than Australia, do you think that it is reasonable to model the Australian education system after the Finnish one in terms of culture and economics? Basi, go ahead. No. <laughs> <laughs> You want to hear more? 
<laughs> no, I, I think in, in general it's a very dangerous idea to try to imitate or model any education system, whether it's a Singapore or China or Canada or wh whatever. I think it's a, it's a wrong way to think altogether. I, I think what Finland or other countries can offer to Australia is a kind of an interesting new space to think about all these practices that you do. For example, this NAPLAN that we discussed. Just go around the world and ask how different countries like Finland or Canada do the same thing that you do here through your NAPLAN. And you see different things that leads to questions that why do you do those things? Why don't you have the same thing as we have here? So that's the kind of right way to use the, the countries, not to imitate or try to copy what the other countries do. <coughs> Um, let me just point out one thing. It was actually, uh, Vivian, I think you initially also asked about um, the nature of uh, the degree, the master's degree, which is required for all teachers right. in Finland. Now, that's something that is, hugely distinguishes uh, the Australian and Finnish models. If you had to have a master's degree to teach in this country, would that change things? Again, Tony, I think it depends on what this master's degree entails. And there are different. There are a lot of studies actually that show that the degree, the level of degree, doesn't really make difference regarding the students' learning. It makes but a difference, doesn't it, to how much you pay your teachers in Finland, because it, it, uh, and and also to the degree of respect that they have in the society. It, it does. But going back to the this degree question, for example, if you have primary school teachers like like Finland has and some other countries, or or kindergarten preschool teachers who have studied four or five or six years education. And, and all kinds of issues related to children growing up. Uh, of course, it makes a difference if you have teachers who have not done that. But, but if you have, you may have somebody who holds a master's degree and teaching mathematics, but doesn't have necessarily a math degree, a math studies, it doesn't make any difference. So I think when you, when you look at Finland and other countries with this question in mind, you always have to ask this question that what are these people actually study? What is, what is a primary school teacher in Finland when she or he graduates? Uh, studied during the five or six years and then ask this question, does this make any difference when she or he is in a classroom? I, I presume you must have thought it made a difference or uh, you wouldn't uh, have had that as part of the Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And what, and, so, what sort of difference does it make? Yeah, and no, not, not only does it because... it make better teachers if they're more educated? Well, not, not necessarily better teachers in terms of pedagogy and what the teachers do, but they, you know, one important thing for teachers is their kind of a self-esteem. In my country, we want to have teachers with a self-esteem <laughs> that they feel that they are professionals just like medical doctors and lawyers and, and others. And if you don't have the same degree, same level of preparation for that, it's very hard to sit no, you with... Did, you did slip back there to say my country when this is your country. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to start from, from the beginning? No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> I, I, we can talk about that but later. But you pick up my point. We'll, we'll come back to the... Yes, I do. Okay. We'll come back to that. Okay, so uh, next question uh, from Erin Kim Rich. Hi. I'm a teacher who works in disadvantaged schools. The latest piece of results tell us that inequality is getting worse and the solution is needs-based funding. Despite this, the government has allocated $4.6 to the private and Catholic sector, essentially turning its back on public education, which houses approximately 65% of the New South Wales student population. As a teacher, I see the impact of these funding wars, the inequality of having to share one book between two, a lack of computers, and depleted student motivation over summer in heat of 40 degree classrooms. How do I keep my students motivated to learn in the face of these political decisions? I'll start with Cindy. How do you keep your students motivated to learn if there is inequity in, and they see it? If they see very rich and wealthy schools in the big cities and the, then they see the, the situation they face, how, does, how hard is it to That's motivate? That's a really hard question. Mm. That's exceptionally hard. Because I think, um, you know, it's about to get kids motivated to learn, it's a, it's, it's a lot more than resources too. You know, I think governments have, you know, is, is focused on money and focused on, on what they can, but it's, it's about what you do with the money and the implementation of, of thinking outside the box. And the problem with the system at the moment is that, you know, people want to be innovative, but they're risk averse and the governments are risk averse. So they don't want to take the risks of doing something different, which you could do if you actually had resources to do it. So I think, you know, to, to get um, kids motivated to learn, it's, it's really, it's, it's a really difficult question. And it's really about the teacher and the school and the system and, and, you know, the support the system gives and the ability to actually do things a little bit different and innovative.
mm. especially in disadvantaged schools. Eddie, let me ask you this question, because you, you went to a uh, selective school in Sydney. Um, you taught at that school. Uh, subsequently, you now teach at a pretty well-resourced school. Mm. How does the inequity question play on your mind? Uh, it plays really strongly. I mean, uh, I teach in Northwest Sydney and it is a school which, um, while being very well resourced, at least until very recently, we had a grand total of 39 demandable classrooms. And it's a struggle in summer because this is Australia. And so it's really important to recognise that uh, no school is exempt from that. But at the same time, I've had the privilege of working across New South Wales. Um, I was in the Riverina earlier this year. And it's just... Uh, it's frankly, it's heartbreaking. I you mean, mean, you uh, mean no public school is ex exempt from that because uh, if you look at the private schools uh, with swimming pools and sporting fields and air conditioned classrooms and very highly paid teachers, etc., does that seem unfair to you? These two systems exist side by side. To me, it's uh, what, what's challenging most about this is how complex and nuanced this situation is. Um, I do think that it's important for people to have some degree of choice when it comes to the styling of school that they go to. Um, I live fairly close to a Montessori school, and that's a very different way of doing things, not sustainable Australia-wide. But if parents are able to, they have a commitment or a conviction to do that, I think they should have the ability to choose that. But really, I think the devil ends up being in the details. Where are those funds actually going to go, and what's it going to mean? I mean, for me, I know um, I shake my head when I look at a federal level and I hear the conversations about funding doesn't make a difference. Uh, class sizes don't matter. For me, I understand, for example, I, I can take a year 12 extension 2 class and give me 60 kids, they'll just go to town. But when I walk into my year 10 class and there are kids there with special needs, with dyslexia, with hearing disabilities, don't tell me that it doesn't make a difference how many teachers or SLSO student learning support officers you have in that classroom. Funding makes a really big difference, but I think we just not, need to be very careful not to make any blanket statements over Yabby. I have lots to say about this. <laughs> I think that for a long time in Australia, we've been trying to offer the champagne education on the beer budget, and we could always do with more funding. I think that, um, you know, when I hear this expression that we, um, we should have needs-based funding, which is, you know, something that we hear in the media and politicians saying, as a teacher, when I hear that, needs-based funding, I know that kid. I've taught that kid. I've given breakfast to that kid. And we need to put a face to these words that we bandy about when we're talking about education. I think too, um, I think that we need to get really clear about the language that we're using when we're talking about this, because I know that um, there are plenty of Catholic schools out there in regional and remote communities where we're fundraising to raise money for everything, all the time. It's not always Kincopel Rose Bay that we should think of when we hear about Catholic schools. The other thing is that I am so sick to death of politicians using funding and education as a political football every time there's an election and just, you know, because we'll have another one, won't we? Again and again and we'll be, you know. So this needs to stop. We need to get clear about this because I can tell you the story of the little boy who needs that funding. And we need to get really serious about this again, just like I said with NAPLAN. It's the, the time has come. We can't just keep, you know, paddling along with this. Jennifer, um, give us your perspective on needs-based funding, on the nature of um, the argument we're having about, or the national discussion we're having about equity. Well, needs-based funding, um, in the most basic sense that um, children with greater educational needs um, require a greater level of resources in order to meet those needs. I think that's you know, an essential concept um, and principle of any kind of school funding system. I was pleased that, um, that Gabby mentioned that disadvantage isn't confined to the public school sector, that there are schools in, in the various school sectors that um, meet those needs, whether they're children from disadvantaged backgrounds, whether they're children with special educational needs. Uh, and it's absolutely true that our funding is not being targeted sufficiently heavily towards the children who need it uh, the most. So I think that's got to be the focus rather than thinking about what has someone else got um, that I would like to have. It's more about making sure that everybody that needs it has sufficient. Uh, and that's where the conversation needs to go. 
Yeah, Parsi, um, I want to come to you on this because I know you've... Someone's talking in my ear at that moment, but I know you were, uh, you've were you travelled around uh, New South Wales uh, with Adrian Piccoli uh, when he was Minister uh, for Education here and you, you actually toured some of the most disadvantaged uh, schools. Um, what struck you most? What, when you looked at it, did you, what do you think could be fixed and how would you do it? It's exactly this thing that colleagues have been talking about here, that when I, when I see the schools where there are obviously needs for uh, children to get support and help and, and different types of programs, uh, those resources, they're often human resources, but often also money is not available. That's something that in many other countries uh, in the world, when I travel around, I see exactly the opposite, that the resources and investments are going to those communities and, and schools where there are the, uh, more needs in, in, in the children. You know, there are many things I, I still don't understand in this my new country here. And, and one of them is, going back to what Eddie was saying, that they, these very same people who say that money doesn't make any difference in education, then all of a sudden sign a $4 billion mm -hmm. check for you know, for those schools that actually already have a lot of money and resources. So that's the kind of, you know, if you put Australia into the big picture internationally, one thing that makes, makes this education system, education systems here very different, is the way they are funded. Uh, that almost all the other OECD countries are giving more money to those communities and children where there are more needs, except Australia. And that's where you are very different. This is not only my opinion. You can read what the OECD and many others are saying even more loudly than you can hear right now. And I don't think that's quite true. We, we definitely do have waiting fund, uh, funded waiting towards children with greater levels of need. My point, I think, was that, that the targeting needs to be a more efficient and more heavily towards that, that group of students. At the moment, there is definitely that, that targeted funding, though. Yeah, but, you know, if I, if I look at the, the research and statistics about where the additional funding here in, in Australia has gone, for example, since 2008, most of the additional funding has gone to non-governmental schools. And these, these schools, as we heard earlier, only cater about 15 per cent of disadvantaged or up original children. I think it should be the other way around, that the, the additional money should go to those schools and communities where there are children who need more to be educated better. Um, remember, if you hear any doubtful claims on Q&A, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Briefly, let us know on uh, Twitter and keep an eye on the RMIT ABC Fact Check and the Conversation website for the results. The next question comes from Sheila Daniel, Daniels Mays. I beg your pardon. Sheila Daniels Mays. Um, our Indigenous envoy, Tony Abbott, says that school attendance is the solution for improving Aboriginal education outcomes. There's no evidence to support this position. Rather, we've got evidence to show that teacher credibility, confidence, as well as student engagement are the drivers for success. So my question is, how do we develop a teaching workforce and a schooling system that Aboriginal students actually want to attend? Yeah, Cindy, we'll start with you, obviously. And um, maybe you could start by... Um, do you agree with that characterisation of Tony Abbott's role? Oh, look, you know, I, I was told I couldn't swear on this television. <laughs> <laughs> and as soon as they mentioned Tony Abbott, I thought oh, there's, that was the only thing that came to mind. <laughs> um, as, as uh, you know, well, well, as I've why, heard... Why, Cindy, why is that? Because if, if you listen to what he's saying, he's, he's claiming to have a, a really genuine... Do you genuine... listen to him? <laughs> I can't believe a cultured, educated man like you would do that. <laughs> um, I'm trying to just talk to his... Uh, well, he claims a sort of passion for Indigenous education. Uh -huh. And now he's, now he's got to be given a job by the Prime Minister to try and do something about it. Will you work with him? Oh, certainly, if he wants to come over to my place. Um, <laughs> but, you know, like... You know, I'll, I'll just go back, you know, we were we were extremely disappointed and concerned when we actually... And I, I've heard this many times and I would agree that you ask for a voice in Parliament and Government and you get Tony. <laughs> Not Tony Jones. I mean, that would be a privilege, but, you know, Tony, <laughs> Tony Abbott, Sweetie. you know. So, um, yes, so what can I say about him? Um, but certainly, you know, for, for Aboriginal kids, you know, he I, I find Tony Abbott doesn't have, uh, I just won't question his educational expertise and experience to, to actually make claims like he does. I think, you know, he's got the wrong end of the stick when he talks about attendance. 
because if you look at kids in uh, Aboriginal kids in New South Wales, where a review was done not so long ago, you will find if you take out the chronic non-attenders, you will find that at most Aboriginal kids attend school most of the time. What they are is not engaged in classrooms. And I think, you know, we need, that's what we need. It's the, it's the purpose of our STEM camps that we run to actually inspire kids to learn and engage them through their culture. I think there needs to have a look at the, the quality of the teacher, the quality of the teaching and what curriculum we actually use in, um, in, um, in the country. But certainly, you know, we need to equip teachers. One, it is true, uh, we do a lot of professional learning and it is true that the, the majority of, the biggest thing that comes out of is the lack of confidence teachers have in teaching Aboriginal studies, Aboriginal perspectives and Aboriginal content. And I guess the more Aboriginal people that are actually involved, the more Aboriginal, um, you know, more Aboriginal role models, the more Aboriginal people are involved, the more professional learning we've done, the more building up of the cultural capability of the workforce, that can only actually be a good thing. And then Tony probably won't have a job then. <laughs> OK. Uh, uh, let's move on, because we do have still some very good questions to go to. Jennifer Sullivan has our next question. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, the accountability and paperwork of teaching increases every year. Our time is constantly eaten up by analysing data, documenting behavioural issues, interviews with parents, photocopying work samples, collecting and annotating evidence, writing risk assessments, the list goes on. Despite this, teachers have not been provided extra time to complete these tasks and this complete disregard for the time required to provide quality lessons and outcomes for students is what is driving teachers from our profession. Isn't it time that the government reduces face-to-face -face teaching and allows us to do our job properly? Gabby, we'll start with you because you have been driven from the profession. Mm -hmm. I think, um, thanks for that, Jennifer. And um, I'm sorry that you're suffering through all that because it's just arduous and, in my opinion, unnecessary. I think, um, you know, we talked earlier about funding. I actually think time is our greatest commodity at the moment in education. And what teachers need is time. They need time to do all this work. Mm -hmm. They need time to um, think about their lessons and plan. And I think what's happening is with all this um, standardisation, data collection, accountability, documentation, it's taking us away from our core purpose, which is to teach our students in front of us. And, you know, I had reached a point towards the end of my teaching career where I was thinking, if the kids just stayed home today, <laughs> I'd be able to get all my work done. That's crazy talk. Right? I'm a teacher. It, it should be all about those children coming Tell me, in. did you find yourself doing, and I, I, I know actually you did because I've read your books, so, but you obviously found yourself in situations where you were having to do uh, paperwork or assessments, or yes. individual assessments, while everyone else went crazy in the classroom. Yeah. I mean, is that a pretty typical sort yes. of scenario? Absolutely. It's, it's totally typical. Teachers at the moment are just going hand to mouth, you know? They're just in survival mode. And they, let me tell you, they are drowning not waving. This paperwork and this administrivia is got, it's driving them out of the profession. Our attrition rates are absolutely shocking. Those poor new graduates who are coming in all shiny eyed and ready to attend to their vocation and in under five years they're out the door. You talk about funding and wasting money and all that kind of stuff. Well hello, let's let's get these people in the in the career that they've chosen and help them to stay there. I think that you know, we have really just lost our way. We're trying to run our schools on a business model and schools are not like anything else. You can't say they're like a business. You can't say they're like our hospitals. You can't say they're like anything else. Schools are schools and they're really unique places where if we're left to be the professionals that we have trained to be, Amazing things will happen, magical things will happen, extraordinary things will happen. But at the moment, we've got too many people trying to layer all these things on us to tell us how to do our job. And it's crippling, it's debilitating for, for all our teachers. OK, let me hear from Eddie, because you still remain bright-eyed, as far as I can see. <laughs> um, how have you managed that? And is this, does this story not ring true to you? Or... Uh, this story as a head teacher of four plus years definitely rings true to me. Uh, risk assessments, reading 350 report comments of a weekend, this is, just, this is life in a school. Um, I think for me what 
is the most important thing to say. Well, there are two, I think. Number one, all these things, I, I'm very eager not to lose the baby with the bathwater. I think all of these structures are great servants and terrible masters. And the problem is when we, we, miss, we miss their purpose or they, they get in the driver's seat and end up telling us as professionals what mm. our job is and how to do it effectively. I think that's a complete reversal of the way things should be. Uh, but when I think about what, why, why is this here? Well, I, I, I was heartbroken when I heard about, it was late last year, uh, there was a school and it was teaching the wrong mathematics course to its mm. students. And we don't want that to happen. Now, the problem is, like, what, this is a bigger problem. Why, why do we live in a society that's run by uh, compliance and regulations that we have to tick boxes to? It's because of this much bigger problem that the teacher workforce has been driven to. And has been, I mean, I know in that school, I've been to that area, um, there was no mathematics head teacher in that school. That's why they didn't know that it was, it's easy to get confused. My principal still gets confused about which one of those courses are which. And so there's a real... With all due respect. With due him. respect, it's okay. <laughs> uh, he, he knows. Now, I, I think for me, this is a symptom rather than a cause. Uh, and we need to get at wh why do we have this system in the first place? Why is it that um, bureaucrats find themselves una unable to trust the profession, that's where we have to attack. Um, Parsi, does this sound familiar to you? Y yes, it does. And this is really what you describe is an is a international thing, ev uh, practically everywhere. And I think it's just to illustrate this uh, kind of a problem that we have had in, uh, around the world, really, that when the authorities are asking or insisting schools to do something more, that they forget to take something away out at the same time. And now when we are considering the Gonski 2.0 and what does it mean for our schools in the future, I think it's very, very important to every time a new thing is coming into the school and in the lives of teachers and principals, that something else has to go out. Mm, yeah. um, I'm going to move on to our next question because we'd still like to get through a few more. Matthew Sly. Hi. Uh, I'm in the first year of a master's degree in secondary teaching in maths and science. And despite what the panel have been saying, <laughs> despite what the panel have been saying, I'm looking forward to pursuing a long career in teaching. However, news and my own uh, recent experience on PRAC has led me to believe that um, children and society at large and parents don't respect teachers as they should. What can be done? to improve the respect and standing for teachers in society. OK, we'll have to keep our answers a bit brief. Gabby, we'll start with you. I think, I think we have to start remoralising our teachers because that's what they're feeling. That's what, that's what they're experiencing. I You've think, been fixing up their morale. Yeah, 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 I do. And I think that needs to come from how we speak about our teachers. I would like to see... Um, parents not looking at schools as though they are consumers and as though they're the customer and the customer's always right. I don't like feeling that I'm threatened by some, a, d a decision I made in the classroom using my professional judgment and then being called to account on that. I think, so I think there's a lot of language that needs to happen around that, a lot of talking that needs to happen around that about how we speak about our teachers and how we talk about them and how we address them and, uh, you know, this idea that parents can just sort of walk in at the end of a school day, you know, I'm a professional, I'd love, for you, I'd love to talk to you as a parent, I'd love for you to make an appointment so we can have that time together and, and I can sit down and properly address your concerns. So I think language and the, and the way we're talking about things would be a really good start. And on that note, I'd love to have teachers, instead of saying I'm feeling stressed and burnt out, I'd love to hear teachers saying I, I'm feeling demoralised because then we're starting to shift this, this discussion to being about the system that we're in, not us not managing our resources. Jennifer, let me, uh, let me ask you, do you, first of all, do you see a kind of decline in respect for teachers in the general public? Um, so, uh, and, and I'd also get you to, to talk to that point uh, that Gabby has made about uh, schools being very different, um, not being something that you can put economic models around as if they're a business. Sure. I, I, I don't think that it's um, across the board that there's a decline in the, the status and respect um, for teaching as a profession. Really? I, I think... You don't, no. You don't think that? I don't. I, I think that um, <sighs> mo many parents have a good relationship um, and respect for their own child's teaching teachers, what we see is, it's a, a strange phenomenon when you look at surveys about how people feel about um, the, the country's education system, that 
most parents are quite happy with their child's teacher and their child's school, but they have quite a dim view of education across the board. And um, so it's a, a strange phenomenon that you see in that respect. Um, having said that, I think that there needs to be also some acknowledgement that not all teachers are fantastic. There is a range um, and some are wonderful uh, and some are, you know, they're doing a good job, but they're not, you know, not necessarily inspiring. And that's the same in every profession. And there's mm. a, a tendency to ignore that fact that, um, yes, one year your child might have a teacher that they're OK. The next year, year, they might have one that's fantastic. Um, and I think it's important to be honest about, mm. uh, about that. Um, can I add to that, that I, I agree with you there. And I think that, um, you know, one of the first things you learn when you go to study to become a teacher is that the students in front of you are not empty vessels. You know, they come with all their cultural capital. And I think we need to acknowledge, too, that teachers who go into this as a vocation, they're not empty vessels either. Good teachers are bringing themselves into their workplace as well. And sometimes, you know, a teacher's having a bad day or, you know, there's pressures at home and because of the nature of the work we do, which is to give of ourselves, that impacts as well. So I, I agree with you that we need to accept that sometimes not all teachers are performing at, you know, maximum, you know, standard because we're human. OK. Yeah. Eddie, I want to get your perspective on this because um, you may have a very different view, um, mm. given that, you know, there are billions of people watching your YouTube versions of your classes, that you travel around, uh, speak to packed houses in rural areas of Australia. I mean, do you sense at all this idea there's been a decline mm. in respect for teachers? Uh, I think it's really difficult to take a... a cultural pulse of an entire country. I think there's a real um, disparate sort of, um, the range of, of different attitudes toward teaching. I can still think back to when I was in year 12 and my own teachers found out that I was going into education and from an academically selective high school, that was just not a thing that was done. <laughs> that was just kind of, <laughs> that's really funny. What are you really doing? Uh, so, so I think that I, I still remember that and I still remember you know, the, the, the thoughts and conversations that I have with parents at my school of those kids and, and the, you know, I, I taught the school captain a couple of years ago who is now becoming a mathematics teacher, which is so exciting for me. But also I know, I mean, I think your question is very personal in that you know, what, what is the thing that you can do? Two things, number one, um, you need to guard that hope. Mm. You're a teacher, that's your job. Uh, I, I go into this, um, I remember in my first year teaching a, um, uh, a particular class and they were in, uh, in mathematics, we call it a year 10, 5.1 class. They've been going through 10 years of mathematics where they just don't get it and they're probably there mainly because of the minimum school leaving age. And sometime in term two, halfway through, they said to me, so you, <laughs> You're still here. You're still trying to teach us. <laughs> and they had gotten used to people giving up on them. And I said Eddie, to him... you know when that bell goes and we have to stop the class? We're pretty close. I get it, I get <laughs> it. You're a professional not giver up -er. That's That's the technical term. So I think there's that. But there's also 100,000 conversations that are going to happen tomorrow between teachers, between parents and children about what do we think about schooling and it's in those conversations that's the way our culture forms our view of education. That's where the difference will be made. OK, and some of those conversations we've been having here with very eloquent uh, teachers and educators, but that is all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel, Parsi Salberg, Jennifer Buckingham, Gabby Stroud, Eddie Wu and Cindy Berwick. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, you can continue the discussion with Q&A Extra on News Radio and Facebook Live, where Elizabeth Jackson is joined by Sydney Uni Professor of Teacher Education, Robin Ewing. Next Monday, Q&A will be live from Melbourne with leading international economist, Geoffrey Sachs, the conservative writer who coined the phrase virtue signalling, James Bartholomew. Uh, Liberal Senator James Patterson, Labor frontbencher Terry Butler and our People's Panellist Linda McIver, uh, a high school computer science teacher who's founded a charity prom to, prom to promote data science education. Until next week, good night.